Hi, everyone. Welcome to After Dark, It's Electric. My name is Alex Pinigas. I've been a staff biologist here at the Exploratorium for about five years now. I love my job. It's really awesome. Um, tonight, what I get to do is talk to you all about brains, which is what I studied in college, and plants, and what they have in common. Uh, plants are just an amateur hobby of mine. I think they're cool. Uh, I'm not a botanist by training, but that's OK. I'm very enthusiastic. So um, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit about signals, electrical signals in our brains and our nervous systems, and electrical signals that are uh, found in plants. First of all, I just want to get out of the way that plants do not have brains. They do not have neurons. They use electrical systems that, while they somewhat resemble those found in the nervous systems of animals, are very different. Um, so they, they don't have brains don't have nerves, they're very different. Um, but first of all, I just want to talk about brains. So this is a, um, a drawing by a famous neurologist named Ramon y Cajal. Um, I ca actually can't remember his first name. His last name is Ramon y Cajal. Um, and uh, this is actually the first type of neurons ever characterized and drawn. These are called Purkinje cells. They're very uh, visible. Um, when you stain them, they have these, this very unique structure. But they do share a lot of structure with other neurons. So you'll notice up on the top of the Purkinje cells, there is this kind of tree, this branching tree. So that's a, part, a really, really important part of the neuron. I'm going to go over three main parts. The dendrites are what receive signals from other neurons. Neurons, as you probably know, communicate with each other using neurotransmitters. So the, uh, the dendrites are going to receive chemical signals in the form of neurotransmitters, and that gets turned into an electrical signal, which then gets propagated down to the second part of the cell. That's the cell body. That's that round part in the center. Um, the cell body essentially collects all these electrical signals that are happening all the time, and it kind of adds them together. So some of those electrical signals are going to be positive, some of them are going to be negative. If they add up to a certain level, then what happens is the third part of the cell, that's that thin extension down from the bottom, that's called the axon. The axon is going to fire a signal if the, the cell body reaches a certain threshold, OK? And that firing, that electrical signal that gets sent down the axon, that's called an action potential. And we'll be talking more about those in uh, just a minute. But first, I want to discuss how we have electrical systems in our brains. So as you probably know, ions are electrically charged well, they are atoms with an electrical charge, or sometimes they are molecules with an electrical charge. Um, these are all basic, just you know, atomic ions. Um, and so because they have an electrical charge, they can actually carry electricity just like electrons can. Electricity is just the flow of charge. It can be electrons, as happens in our electricity, or it can, you know, in, in the wires in our houses and our, our workplaces, or in our nerves, the flow of electricity is actually carried by ions. Um, specifically, potassium, that's the K plus, sodium, that's the Na plus, chloride, which is Cl minus, and then in some cases also calcium. Um, that's an, another really important signaling ion in the nervous system. Now, when you look at this graphic, uh, you'll notice that some, uh, there's actually a difference in concentration on either side of the graphic. The line down the center of the graphic is like a cross section of the cell membrane. So the right side is inside the cell. The left side is outside the cell. Outside the cell, there's a much higher concentration of sodium and chloride. Inside, there's a much higher concentration of potassium. Now, there's actually kind of an equilibrium that's kept. Um, and there are, uh, there's actually a really important protein. There's that purple channel up on the upper part of the membrane. That's a. Um, that's a channel. That's allowing ions to flow across it. Now, usually those channels are closed, but there are active channels as well. The really, really important one for us to know about is the sodium-potassium pump. That is the uh, most important uh, channel in our nervous systems. Uh, at rest, it consumes about, any, you know, estimates vary from anywhere between 25 
and 50% of all of our brain's energy, just this one pump in the membranes of our brains. And what that's doing is it's pumping three sodiums outside the cell and exchanging that with two potassiums which go inside the cell. You can kind of think, it like a, think of it like a, a rotating lock where three molecules go on one side, two go on the other, and then it just kind of switches them. And in the process of doing that, it uses the energy of burning a single molecule of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which you may know is kind of the, the fundamental unit of energy in all life on Earth. Um, so just that tiniest little bit of energy is enough to transmort, transmit or transport three sodiums outside the cell, two potassiums in. Um, once that balance is established, then you can have electrical signals like the action potential, which I know sounds like an 80s buddy cop movie, which is why I stuck up this poster. But it's actually um, much more interesting, I think. Uh, so this is, I know I'm throwing a lot of graphics at you, but this is kind of a chart of the voltage across the membrane. So voltage is just the difference in, in charge across, you know, in this case, across the membrane. So normally, the way our, the ions in our cells are kept, there's a resting voltage of negative 70 millivolts of the, across the membrane of the cell. When the neuron receives a signal, what happens is some of these channels, some of the other channels in the membrane open, and they allow ions to flow across that membrane freely. So when a neurotransmitter, you know, ends up on the dendrites, the dendrites open up some of those channels, and sodium so starts to flow into the cell. Now, the flow of sodium, because it's positively charged, is actually going to increase the membrane potential, increase the voltage across the membrane back up towards zero. That's called a depolarization, because it's polarized negatively. Um, as you can see, there's a couple little yellow lumps on the bottom labeled failed initiations. So if the depolarization is not strong enough, if not enough of these channels open up, there's going to be just a small blip in the voltage of the membrane. But if, if the signal is strong enough and enough of those sodium channels open, what you get is you get to the threshold voltage. That's about negative 55 millivolts. Once you get to that threshold, enough of the sodium channels open up that there's a kind of positive feedback loop. These channels open up in response to a positive change in voltage. So when there's a big positive change in voltage, a bunch of them open up simultaneously, and sodium just floods across the membrane. This actually also causes potassium channels to open. So if you remember, sodium is going to flow in, potassium is going to flow out. And while we get to this, this big rise, Pretty quickly, the um, sodium channels are actually going to close again. The potassium channels are going to stay open, and that is going to repolarize the membrane. So you see that rising phase, that's mostly just, that's from the sodium channels opening and allowing a big positive voltage change. Once those close, there's no positive uh, ion flow into the cell. It's instead going out of the cell, and the voltage goes back down. That's the falling phase. And it actually even overshoots the resting potential just a little bit. And you end up going down below 70, below negative 70. And so there's a, just, there's a little refractory period where the cell can't fire right after the action potential. So this is the fundamental unit of electrical transmission in our nervous system. An action potential is it's all or one. It either happens or it doesn't. And it's always the same size. So our nerves communicate, the axons send these um, action potentials down them in bunches. And how many action potentials it's sending is kind of how strong a signal the next cell is going to get. <laughs> okay, so we've talked a little bit about our brains. Does anyone have any questions right now? I know I really, that was like a three lectures in a college uh, neuro class packed into 10 minutes. So let me know if, you, if anything's unclear at this point. We all good? Yeah. Yes, exactly, because that's where the difference in concentration in ions is. Good question. Thank you. So um, we're going to move on to some of our very uh, charismatic plants. We've got Venus flytraps. Uh, Charles Darwin actually famously called them one of the most wonderful plants in the world. These have been studied for a really long time. You can probably imagine why. We, often, we don't often see plants that can move 
you know, visibly before our own eyes. They all move kind of very slowly, but this is really an unusual plant. Um, as you probably know, Venus flytraps are famous because they're carnivorous. They're probably the most famous carnivorous plant. They um, have these little tiny hairs, and actually you can see them in the previous slide. If you look inside the open trap, you'll see these little hairs. And each of those hairs is actually sensitive to touch. Okay? If, I, if an insect finds itself unlucky enough to be inside one of those traps, or stupid enough, um, it may trigger those hairs. If it triggers two different hairs within 20 to 30 seconds, that's enough to close the trap. Or if it triggers the same hair and kind of holds it for at least two seconds, that will also trigger the trap. Um, an interesting thing about Venus flytraps is that despite their name, they actually don't capture a lot of flying insects. About 90% of their prey is actually ter terrestrial. So it's ants or spiders or beetles, very small beetles. They don't get that big. Um, and uh, so let's just talk about how this happens in Venus flytraps. Um, as I intimated earlier or kind of, you know, alluded to, uh, Venus flytraps also use electrical signals kind of like the ones in our own brains. So um, in our skin, in the neurons that sense touch in our skin, we have what are called mechani mechanically gated ion channels. So you remember those ion channels earlier that open in response to a depolarization, in response to you know, a stimulus. The stimulus in our touch receptors is touch. It's mechanically gated. Same thing with these hairs on the Venus flytrap. If you bend that hair, it's actually opening channels in the membrane of the, the cells inside the Venus flytrap. Now, the, the shape of the Venus flytrap, it's kind of open like this. Right here in the midline is where there's these two layers of cells. These two layers of cells are very important. They are kind of like pushing against each other. They have a, a tension. Um, between the two layers of cells. And that tension is what's keeping the, tr the trap open. It's almost like it's spring-loaded, like a, like a mouse trap, okay? And what's happening when you um, trap it is you are releasing the tension, and that's why it's able to close so quickly, okay? So what's happening to release the tension is, like I said, the hair opens up the gated channels in the membranes of the cells, and all these ions flow across the membrane. That causes, well, the, the old theory was that that flow of ions caused water to flow out of the cell due to osmosis. Osmosis is its whole, whole, whole own tricky thing. I did a presentation on it a couple months ago. It's a lot more complicated than you might even remember from high school. But basically, the gist of osmosis is when the concentration in ions change between two bodies of water that are connected by a membrane, the water has to flow across the membrane to equalize the concentration of ions, okay? That's, that's what's really important. So when the, the old theory was that when these ions are flowing across the membrane, the water actually has to follow it due to osmosis. And that's causing a shape change in the cells because, you know, more water is going to get fatter. Less water is going to get a little shriveled up. Um, however, some recent studies have actually shown that the flow of osmosis is actually not fast enough to account for the speed of the trap closing in Venus flytraps. So the new theory is actually that there are little pores in between the two layers of cells in the rib of the Venus flytrap. And the, the flow of ions is actually causing water to flow between those two layers. It's, not, it's much faster than just flowing across a membrane because there's actually like holes where the, the water is flowing through. They're big. And that rapid flow of water between the two is causing a tension change. And that change in tension allows the Venus flytrap to snap shut and for this poor little guy to get stuck inside. So the second plant I wanted to talk about is called Mimosa pudica. Um, many of you may be familiar with this. Um, it's called sensitive fern, uh, shame plant. <laughs> um, I really like dormulones. Uh, that one's amazing. There's, there's a million different names for this plant. Um, it grows all over the world. Um, it's invasive in much of the world. Um, and the reason it's famous is because it closes in response to touch. Um, actually, if you, um, we want to look over here, um, we can actually touch some of these plants. And you can see 
they close in response to being touched. The leaves are going to close right up. And we actually have an exhibit with these. Um, unfortunately, the ones in our exhibit tend to close over the course of the evening because they're, um, they're light receptive. They like to have, um, you know, they only like to be open during the day. Yeah, so let's try another one. Let's see. This one looks good. So yeah, there you can see it very rapidly. If you pinch the leaves a little bit, they close right up. So yeah, it's visible to the eye. It's a relatively rapid um, movement for a plant. Um, no one is really sure exactly why they do this. Um, it's kind of surprising. It takes a lot of energy for a plant to move like that. Um, there are a couple theories. One is that it closes up to prevent predation. It's you know responding to insects or other small animals eating it, and it's saying, ah, don't touch me. Um, it might be in response to heavy rain. You know, it, this grow, grows in the tropics, so a heavy rain could damage a delicate plant like this. Maybe the leaves are folding up to decrease the amount of damage that's dealt by um, heavy rain, or maybe it's um, closing up in the evening to prevent it from losing water through its leaves. Plants are always losing water through um, evaporation, through the pores in their leaves. So when it closes up, I don't know, maybe it's slowing down the evaporation. No one's really sure, like I said. Um, this is a photo I took inside our plant room the other day. I really wanted to c concentrate on one particular structure on the uh, mimosa. Unfortunately, I was using my camera phone so, or my phone camera. <laughs> so um, it's, I couldn't get in quite as close as I wanted. But if you look at where that, um, there's a leaf that's kind of extending up into the left, and it meets the main stem near its base, there is kind of a fat structure, okay? That's called the pulvinus. The pulvinus is where the action, or I, I, I should say rather the action potential is happening in the mimosa plant. There are actually two separate action potentials in response to touch in a mimosa. The first is, again, those mechanically gated um, channels that are opening up and allowing a signal to propagate down the cell. Um, those uh, signals, actually, interestingly, unlike the ones in our brains, which are kind of mediated between cells by neurotransmitters, so it goes from being an electrical signal to being a chemical signal back to being an electrical signal. In the mimosa, it's completely electrical. The cells have these pores between them that allow them to communicate a little bit. They allow some cytoplasm from the cells to move back and forth. And so as the, the electric charge goes down one cell, it actually comes up to the other cell and then propagates down that cell as well. Um, and then when, it gets, when that signal gets to the pulvinus at the base of the leaf, what happens is there's a second action potential and that second action potential is what causes the leaf to fold up. So um, I, I'm sorry for another extremely complicated diagram. This one did really help me. Um, basically, turgor is water pressure. Um, if you're going from the cell to the left to the cell on the right, you're having a cell that's kind of crumpling up. When you're going from the cell to the right to the cell on the left, it's getting bigger. It's expanding. So. Um, as the action potential gets to the, um, these motor cells, there's two types of motor cells expanding and contracting, um, they open up these channels again. The ions flow either in or out of the cell. And this time it actually is theorized that it's just through osmosis, that the water is just flowing across the membrane, and that's either causing the cell to shrink or to grow. So now that we've done all the technical babble, we can get to the fun part. So um, I'm going to come down here. And um, when I originally thought of this um, activity, I was just going to do a lecture. But I found out that there's actually a, um, uh, a little electronic device called a spiker box. It's sold at uh, BackyardBrains.com, um, whom we've worked with in the past. And it allows you at home to record electrical signals from plants, from your own nervous system from various sources. And so I've actually got a little app running on my um, phone that's going to allow us to see um, these electrical signals that we've been talking about. So Kayla here is going to help me out with the camera so we can see this up on the top screen. Let me get my poker. Yeah, so we're going to go to this trap right here. 
We'll wait. <laughs> we don't want to um, <laughs> spoil the fun. All right. OK, so you can see this trap right here is the one that we're going to stimulate with this little orange poker. Behind it, we've got this kind of green line going across the screen. Um, there's a little bit of noise. Um, the, the signal has to be really boosted. And so you get a little bit of noise in there. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to poke one of these little tiny hairs. And that's going to, I sure hope, <laughs> it's going to show up on the screen. OK, you ready, Kill? All right. So there we go. That, there's our depolarization. And um, if we wait a minute, a good 20 or 30 seconds, we can do it again. Or we can just let the, the trap uh, close up. You're not supposed to let your traps close up too often without meals, because it's bad for the plant. But um, I'm not too worried about it. We're going to put these plants into dormis dormancy pretty soon anyway, and they'll just die back. So let's do that again. And actually, let's do a couple stimuli in close succession. And there we go. Now it's all closed up. So that's how Venus flytraps do it. Um, we can try and do the mimosa. The mimosa is a little unhappy because it's not in the light. But it may still actually do an action potential if we try it. So I'm actually going to switch out the wires. I've got our electrode already hooked up to the mimosa. And here's our ground wire. Got to hook that up, too. All right. Give that a chance to settle down. All right, let's give this a shot. I'm going to pinch this stem right up here where the electrode is hooked around. Eh, this one's a little tired, I guess, because it's not in the light. But it did get, have a little bit of a spike. Let's try it again. Yeah. <laughs> that one's being a little petulant. But it did go a little bit. Um, it's already closed up. Like I said earlier, these ones tend to close up if it's not directly lit. That's why I have these bright lights over here. Um, so I can keep them open. Um, but uh, if anyone's interested, um, we can, you can come back in a minute once we're done with the, the talk. And uh, we can try it again with some that are open. So um, that's, the, that's my talk. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I do want to give a big shout out to um, Greg Gage and all the people at Backyard Brains um, who helped us out with this. Uh, this activity was really, um, really kind of invented by them. And I was just really inspired by it. So I wanted to do it all for you all tonight. Um, feel free to stick around if you have any questions. And thanks very much.